Um, a huge welcome to Ganesh Ram, sir, from Avendus Park. Um, we are really privileged to have you here, sir. Uh, I still remember the meeting where uh, me and Arushi ji had a discussion with you and, uh, you know, when we had requested you for a guest lecture, you offered four or five topics and we were having a huge uh, debate which topic to choose from and which is where we thought we'll learn banking from you, sir, in today's session. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out time on your busy schedule. Uh, everyone in the session is aware of your background and yet let me try and introduce you a bit. So uh, as everyone is aware, Ganesh Ram sir is head of institutional equity research at Avendus Park. He has more than two decades experience in the industry, his prior work experience in banking sector and has worked a lot in the banking sector itself. So which is where, you know, uh, of the four or five topics which Ganesh Ram sir had offered, uh, we thought it would be best for all of our students to learn from you, sir, on these particular topics. Um, this is just a official disclosure from the Avendus Park team. Um, obviously, all the discussions which are uh, going to take place in this session are in no way any sort of recommendations and it's purely educational perspective an initiative which Ganesh Ram sir has been very kind enough to agree with us uh, to dispart his experience and knowledge through the course of today's session. Um, I think, sir, we can, uh, you know, uh, we can begin with the session and the stage is yours, sir. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shailesh. And thanks, Arushi, for uh, having me here. Um, quick uh, background, as Shailesh said, uh, uh, I've been in the markets from about 2001, uh, early one, 2001. For the first five years, I was in fixed income. I was a credit analyst initially with Standard Chartered Bank and then with uh, HSBC. Uh, since 2006, uh, January, I've been with uh, Spark, uh, was the uh, financials, the banks and NBFC sector analyst, uh, head of research. And for the last uh, 11 years, uh, 10 and a half years, I've been the head of equities with uh, all the functions rolling up into me. That's the uh, quick background on, on myself. Um, as they said, banking sector is what uh, I know most and uh, uh, it's close to the heart because uh, 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 that's a sector which uh, I've obviously worked in and I've been the analyst for the sector for pretty much throughout my career. Um, so so that's, uh, that's, that's an area of interest and happy to uh, uh, impact or to uh, help uh, budding analysts like many of you to learn a little bit from the sector about the sector and um, uh, in that sense I'm more than happy to contribute uh, to your knowledge even if it is one percent more knowledge which you gain today that's good enough for uh, you know for for both of us to to uh, to, to have time well spent uh, in that context uh, uh, you know, unless you want to sh start off with some questions, else I'll share my screen. Arushi, if you could uh, close this, I'll share my screen and we'll get started. And before that, if any of you have anything to start off with as uh, introductory questions, um, we could, uh, Shailesh, uh, you think, or should I start? Uh, so we do have few questions, but I guess that is something which we would want to stick to the present, you know, let's say when the presentation comes up. So we have received few questions from the materials which you had shared. Sure. And I'll try to relay those questions on behalf of the candidates. And, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that we learn a lot from you and then perhaps get a chance to interact with you. Sounds good. So I'll first share my screen. And uh, so the way I thought I should do it is first... Uh, you know, uh, I hope my screen is now visible. So, uh, you know, it's a primer on banks. Okay. And I thought I'll give you a perspective. There are two parts to this. First part is giving you an overview on uh, on banks and NBOCs and uh, give a sense of how, uh, you know, the whole, uh, how you should understand a bank and how that whole banking model works. Second part of the conversation is um, we'll spend time on understanding how we value banks, um, you know, and how what are all the things that go into understanding and valuing banks. So there are two parts to it. Okay, 
I'll start off with the most important basic understanding. I always, as an, I, 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 whenever I take up a company and I look at multiple years, I bring it to a base of 100, okay? And bringing it to a base of 100 actually helps me to understand, uh, you know, relate, we relate to the numbers a lot better, okay? Than looking at it in absolute numbers, base of 100 helps me, okay? Now, what I do, what I have done here is, uh, HDFC Bank, okay, FI23, before the merger with HDFC, I just took their annual report and I brought it to a base of 100, okay. Now, what I mean by base of 100 is if the balance sheet is 100 rupees, size of the balance sheet, net worth is 11 rupees, predominantly contributed by reserves and surplus, okay, and uh, which has both the share premium and the accumulated profits of over the years, and uh, that constitutes about 11%. So when you start a bank, you need to infuse equity. Uh, that becomes the source for uh, raising deposits. And uh, deposits, there are three types of deposits, which constitute, as you can see there, 76% of the total, uh, 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 you know, uh, the funding comes from deposits. There are three kinds of deposits, as many of you will know, it's reasonably straightforward. Current account which um, businesses open with banks, cheapest source of funding. There is no interest uh, uh, at, uh, that banks pay for balances kept in current account, which is 11% of that total. So uh, as a percentage of deposits, 11 on 76 is one way to see. Uh, 11 plus 22, which is basically CASA as we call it, that as a percentage of 76 is the CASA proportion. But what I've done here is everything on total balance sheet size, including net worth, borrowings, and other liabilities. So uh, the proportions are uh, to that extent different. Uh, savings accounts are what individuals open, where most banks offer 3.5% interest. That's also low cost, but some of them offer higher. As you know, IDFC first or even Kotak Bank offers more interest on sa savings account. So the the uh, out of the total funding available, a third of the funding for banks come from these low cost uh, sources of financing. Now, building this is a huge effort. You know, uh, transaction banking. You need to be the banking uh, bank account where uh, salaries get credited, uh, incomes get credited. Uh, you know, for a business, sales needs to come into this account and you know, outflow comes from, from this account. You pay salaries, you pay for your vendors, you pay your, uh, uh, you know, landlords or, or 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 all the, so collections, payments, day in, day out, imports, exports. The core is current account. So the, this is an outcome, but what goes into it to for that money to come in, for that low cost funding to come, trust is built. It takes maybe 10 years to build. Uh, you need to have the distribution network. You need to have a build a source of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that whole transaction banking. It takes huge amount of franchise building efforts, corporate and retail put together for you to generate it. And and once you get it, you 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 are eligible for this kind of seven times leverage. More actually, banks can take even more leverage. But uh, 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 you know, this is. This is the most difficult part for a bank in terms of raising the liability side of things. Okay, but it comes with it a lot of low cost uh, uh, benefit which uh, banks enjoy. Okay, as float income, as as low cost deposits. Uh, term deposits are uh, uh, a larger part. Okay, these are uh, less than five crores is called retail. More than five crore deposits are called wholesale. Uh, interest rate depends on the debtor. It depends on, uh, you know, across banks. So typically, depending on the bank, it's about six, seven percent. Some of them are close to eight percent. So that's about uh, forty percent of the total funding. Apart from this, there are other sources as well. Eight percent of the funding comes from uh, borrowings. Borrowings are bonds. Borrowings from other banks. Borrowings from RBI. Borrowings from even non-banks uh, like, uh, say, Asian Development Bank or or other uh, financial institutions uh, subscribe to your bonds or, or uh, debentures, they are part of it, okay? 
uh, and then your other liabilities which are their provisions and and other so this is the funding source of a bank okay uh, uh, i see some noise in the background if uh, just check if you are on mute uh, so that it helps okay so so uh, so that's that's the that's the funding source right that's the key ultimately uh, you know liabilities uh, feed into assets and assets feed into liabilities. I'm going to talk to you on that as well, but I'm just giving you a, a bird's eye view on the, the balance sheet structure of a bank. Okay. The, the obviously where it goes into where this assets, these liabilities get, uh, where does it get funneled into? Uh, as you, as you know, there is something called CRR. Okay. Uh, which banks need to maintain 4.5% uh, uh, of the total uh, uh, demand and time liabilities, the deposits and other funding goes into, it's kept with Reserve Bank as cash. Uh, they don't earn interest. Okay. It is money kept by the Reserve Bank as a monetary tool and as a, uh, you know, uh, emergency funding uh, in, 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 um, in situations where there is, uh, uh, you know, a run on the banks or, or whatever scenario, exception scenario, Reserve Bank always will step in and this is the money that is kept as uh, it's both a monetary tool to control inflation money supply i'll explain all this and it's also a lender of last resort kind of uh, emergency funding for which this cash reserves are being kept okay uh, then you have the investments uh, when you take deposits uh, the regulatorily as per uh, requirements banks are, are required to keep 18% in in government bonds uh, that for which banks earn interest they are uh, they earn lesser interest than uh, other loans because uh, government doesn't uh, uh, when you invest in a government bond the, it's almost uh, 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 not almost it is riskless in some form if you hold it to maturity you can't lose money it's you 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 are uh, you know ultimately bank, government can print money and give you money back but um, but still uh, it is reckoned as the uh, bond yields uh, and it's a reflection of all the monetary rate of interest then you have banks also invest in equities or other bonds they might have subsidiaries and others, which are another small portion of the balance sheet. A uh, large portion of it gets lent out. 64% of the total uh, assets go into loans. Okay? And keep in mind, when, uh, when we look at return on assets, not all 100 rupees gets lent out. You know, many, many, uh, not many will know. Only 64% gets lent out as loans. There can be loans for retail loans, term loans, working capital loans. The proportions vary, but uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but but keep in mind that not all hundred is lent out. Only about two thirds of it gets lent out. Okay. Then you have uh, fixed assets, which are the banks, uh, buildings, and furniture, and others. And then you have your advance tax and other current assets, which which are uh, part of the small part of the overall balance sheet. So I've just give you a given you a banks. Uh, you know, base of 100, bird's eye view on how a bank's balance sheet looks, the various parts of it. Okay. Um, uh, Shailesh, do you think we should have a question after every slide or we should continue talking and end of it, we have a Q&A session? I think the uh, second option is better. Uh, yes, sir. I think that way, you know, we can uh, yeah. conserve on time as well and we can yeah. make sure that if something is about to be covered in the slides later, the flow doesn't yeah. get disrupted. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Sir. Uh, and uh, and uh, students, make feel free to uh, keep your notes or, or questions. We'll answer all of them. Right. So this, I guess, gives you a bird's eye view on a bank's balance sheet. Now, how does it translate into revenues? So uh, uh, just keep in mind, 100 rupees is the total assets of the bank. And that's put to, uh, that generates revenues. So interest income comes. That is seven rupees for HDFC Bank out of hundred rupees of total assets. Not all are interest earning, as I told you. Interest earning, are, this doesn't earn interest. Fixed assets don't earn interest. Other assets don't earn interest. What earns interest are only these two. Okay, this earns less interest than this. Okay, keep that in mind. And and uh, so the blended interest income on the total loans, total uh, asset book, not loans, I thought it's 7.1% on total interest bearing liabilities, which is basically your deposits and borrowings. Banks pay interest, which is uh, including low cost, high cost, all of them. 
seven point. This is we are talking of HDFC Bank for fiscal twenty three as one example. The number will vary as per for every other bank. Okay, so so the banks make an interest of three point uh, net interest income to total assets of three point eight percent. Now this is not net interest margin or this is not spread. Okay, I have just explained it little differently there because this I told you is on total assets. Now, if you look at it only on interest earning assets, which is basically what I've circled here, investments and advances, it advances is they generate 8.6%. Investments give them 6.4. Given the proportions, the blended interest earned is 7.9%. Interest earned similarly deposits, as I told you, current account is 0% interest. Sa savings account, gives, they pay 3.2%. Term deposits, they pay 4.8. Total blended cost of deposits is 3.6, which means the spread they make is 4%. So they lend it 8%, 4% is their spread. Uh, and net interest margins are 4.2%. Okay, This is the overall uh, uh, income they make. Okay, And then they make other income. Other income has fee income when when you uh, you know fee incomes you pay when you take a credit card you pay credit card fees when you take a loan they lay have loan processing fees uh, or you know you have a locker with the bank they take locker charges you take a checkbook sometimes they charge if you don't have minimum balances they charge fees so banks have about hundred different sources of fee income okay they you open a guarantee they pay fees you pay you open a uh, you have a corporate wants, uh, you know, open a letter of credit. I'll explain what that means. Uh, uh, you know, you pay fees. So fee income is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this one. So which means out of 100 rupees of total assets, the bank makes 5% as the total income. Okay. Operating costs, which are basically salaries or all the branch expenses and everything else, that's a 2% distribution. This is without this employees or the branch network you don't get the uh, you know the whole uh, income profile uh, so so that's that's the necessary spend ppop is pre operating uh, pre provision operating profit which is 3% so if they if they, the bank takes 100 rupees as total assets they have lent or the total balance sheet size is 100 3 rupees is what hdfc bank has made as pre-provision profit for themselves. Provisions, provisions are for uh, non-performing loans. If many borrowers will be uh, you know, in, unable to repay the loans. They will default. Uh, there are various rules on how much to provide for it and others, I'll come to it. But for HDFC Bank in FI 23, 0.5% of 100 rupees was the uh, provisions they have made. This is a cost of doing business. Banking sector is the only business amongst, you know, consumer businesses or every other business. Bank is the only where you give customer money. Okay. So the easy part is to give money. The difficult part is in collecting the money. In every other business, you take money from the customer, you sell a car or a bike or whatever. In this business, it's opposite. So keep that uh, fundamental. This is actually the most important cost item which in a bank, uh, you know, the, the most, when I mean cost item, I'm saying the quality of lending gets demonstrated in this one line item and uh, across years, not year, one year, but across many years, this gets demonstrated. Pre-tax profit is 2.6, post-tax return on assets 1.9. And as I told you, uh, you know, uh, if you look, the total net worth was 11 bucks and they uh, borrowed about uh, 86 rupees. So that's close to about uh, close to eight times. That's exactly the leverage which uh, they have. And as a result, 1.9% return on assets give them, gives them about 17% return on equity. Okay. This is where they come down to. This is what a PNL looks like. So I've just gone to a base of 100. If a bank to, to generate, to just to recap, to have 100 rupees of total funding it creates 100 rupees of assets 100 rupees of assets generates uh, 17 rupees of roe for the bank okay uh, i guess this also gives you a broad 
flavor of what a bank's balance sheet is, how it looks like, the various components in it, the P and L, uh, the income statement, how it looks. Uh, what do you mean the the loan pricing that you when you take a loan they charge you eight percent, nine percent. That is the yield. Uh, when they put it in bonds, that's the investment yield. This is the cost of deposits, and this is the NIM or net interest margin which they uh, end up with. I guess this helps. Uh, keep your questions. If any, we will we will come to answering it later on. Uh, some more points which you uh, many of you would have heard about in banks, which is some relating to asset quality and uh, GNPA, which is some of all the non-performing loans, gross net non-performing assets. That's what it is. Non-performing loans are loans which uh, the customer has not repaid uh, on time. Okay. Uh, slippage is different to gross NPS. Gross NPS is the stock of loans not having been repaid by the customer in the balance sheet. The flow is called slippage. Slow, uh, the, the flow means the fresh non-performing loans, which are uh, in the, in the uh, you know, annual, in that period, could be quarter, annual period, that fresh, the number of value of loans, which, that which has become outstanding during this year, okay? Uh, that is slippage. Net NPAs are net of provisions you make. Provisioning coverage is the amount of non-performing provisions as a percentage of gross NPA. What has, uh, what has been provisioned into the P&L, where you have created the cost into the P&L, it's called provisioning coverage ratio, as a, that is provisions as a percentage of gross NPAs. SMA means special mention accounts. If an asset has been owed you for up to 30 days, it's called SMA 0. 30 to 1 to 60, it's called SMA 1. 61 to 90 is called SMA 2. And there is also something called restructured loans, which many of you might have heard during COVID or before that. Uh, you know, borrowers who are not able to repay as per the agreed repayment schedule, they will want to reschedule their loans. Say they will want a five-year loan to become a 10-year loan because their business uh, has slowed down. They are not able to repay it. So they want to extend the tenor of the loan or, or those are called restructured loans. It's based on the terms agreed between the bank and the borrower. Normally, a restructured loan is considered as impairment except during special situations where a reserve bank allows the bank to call it as normal loan, which happened during COVID when businesses were literally shut for, uh, you know, for first uh, six, nine months. So basically without creating, without calling it uh, non-performing loans, without calling it as a restructured loan, banks could continue calling it as a normal loan. This is the, you know, the some of the important terms in the bank to understand asset quality. There is another thing called capital adequacy, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, simply said, it is the net worth, but it is not so simple, not as straightforward. It is not uh, as, and explain to you what it means. There is something called risk weighted assets, which is not all the loans here, these investments, these advances, not all are treated equally, okay? It depends on the category of risk of them. For example, if you if a bank subscribe, subscribes to a bond of the say state government, the risk weight is 0%, okay? If it is a state government or a central government, it is 0%. If it is given to a AAA corporate, okay? The country's best companies, the risk, lowest risk, they are not zero risk, but they are AAA quality, meaning highest rating, the risk weight is 20%, double A is 30%, A rated 50%, uh, triple B, double B, unrated, they're all different risk weights. Interestingly, you will see here, unrated is lesser risk than double B and below, okay? Uh, this is something where, uh, 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 you know, many prefer being unrated than being badly rated, okay? Uh, one of those uh, idiosyncrasies in banks. Similarly, when they lend to NBFCs, uh, the risk weights, even if it is AAA, NBFC, 
the risk weights are not the same they are different this was a regulation regulatory change which happened uh, uh, 3 4 months back they increase the risk weights because reserve bank has become very a uh, little risk averse or a little watch watchful of uh, uh, lending to non bank financial services companies uh, and so they've increased the risk weights the way we saw we here very similarly Loans that individuals take varying if it's a home loan, uh, you take the risk weights depending on the customer category and uh, you know the ticket size and uh, it's 35 to 50 percent because the risk is lesser. You know, uh, it is generally regarded that if you have a home loan, the probability of you defaulting is lesser because, uh, you know, the, the underlying asset is there. The building is there, the land is there. So basically, uh, you know, the risk is regarded lesser. Whereas if it's an unsecured personal loan, the risk is 125%. If it's a credit card, it's 150%. So even if a loan, uh, say a bank gives an unsecured personal loan for 100 rupees, from a risk weight category, it is 150%. So it makes it 150 rupees risk weighted assets in the bank's balance sheet okay for the compute so this various uh, components are there various kinds of loans are given here and and um, all this goes into the calculation of capital whether the bank has adequate capital in its balance sheet is, is this proportion is it high enough it is a function of the risk in the asset side and that risk is not same it's a function of risk weighted assets and uh, in this is various names here risk weighted assets the sum of it it not just includes the credit risk there is also something called market risk or operations risk associated to it and all those are added up to form risk weighted assets uh, then on that uh, you know there are minimum requirements there are various kinds of capital uh, common equity tier one, what we call CET one, that has to be 5.5% of risk weighted assets. There is something called capital conservation buffer, uh, another 2.5%. So the minimum capital requirement has to be 8%. Then you are allowed to take some other sources of capital called additional tier one, which can be up to 1.5%. Then there is something called tier two capital, which are quasi capital kind of uh, uh, you know, which go into tier two capital. Uh, and these are the minimum requirements on capital adequacy that banks, all banks need to have. In fact, most banks are well above these levels uh, after uh, extended period of, uh, you know, uh, uh, improvement we did in the pre-COVID or even up in the first year of COVID till 2020, balance sheets of banks had a lot of challenges. And this clean up and recapitalization and improving the balance sheet structure happened in that uh, that period so i guess this gives you a broad sense i know there are a lot of lingos here and 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 jargons and and it could confuse but but we'll try to keep it simple okay uh, explain this point now the banking how's the market share okay out of the total loans uh, don't get scared by the number in march uh, last march we had about 143 trillion rupees, which is 143 lakh crores of the total banking sector's loan book put together, which is, as I showed you, this 64.9% is what I'm adding, uh, you know, accumulating for all banks put together. Only banks, not NBFCs, only banks put together is 143 lakh crores. It's a the number of zeros are crazy, but just get a sense of it. Uh, 143 lakh crores. Within that, okay, uh, PSU banks are 58%, private banks are 38%, foreign banks are 3%, and there is a new category called small finance banks, which are 1%. Small finance banks as a category came less than six, seven years back, and they have grown on to become 1% of the entire banking system. Similar breakup on liabilities, deposits, which again, I go back to this line item here on deposits alone, 76%, okay, adds up to 190 lakh crores. So you can see the balance 
if many of you this uh, 47 odd lakh crores is basically money which the bank has taken as deposit but not given a loan uh, i will at some stage want to hear from you where you think that money went uh, uh, it's not gone as a loan so it's gone somewhere else what is it uh, we just keep that in mind and for if in that ratio within psu banks 61 percent if look at it, this used to be 77% over the last 10 decade or so. They have, PSU banks have kept losing market share to private banks and they've come down to, yeah, the private banks market share has almost doubled over this period and they've now become one third of the banking system. Foreign banks have broadly remained in this 4.5% thereabouts range. And, uh, you know, and, and PSU banks were 77%, they've become 57 they've lost to the private banks who gained who doubled their market share in just 10 years okay this is the uh, again one more bird's eye view just to get a flavor of how the landscape of banks appear where does the money go to okay uh, i told you this 143 odd lakh crores where is it uh, lent to okay i have taken more recent data this was in march 23 i have just taken jan 24 data 160, 143 lakh crores has become 160 lakh crores, okay? Uh, where it went, small portion to what is called food credit. You can ignore that. Uh, the balance is uh, uh, non-food credit. 12% went into agriculture, agriculture including allied uh, activities like um, uh, it could be uh, farm equipments, purchase or things like that. 22% uh, went into industry, okay? Break it up micro small 4%, medium 1.8%, large corporates took 16.5% and for break that up 16.5, infra was half of it. Uh, this is half of 16.5%. Infra includes power, roads, airports and all those. That's 50% of the loans given by banks to large corporates. Okay. Then you have services. Services includes, uh, you know, it could be uh, uh, cab operators or 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 uh, retail shops or NBFCs are also categorized. That's the largest category within services. They are not included in industry. They are included in services, lending to NBFCs. Okay. Then almost one third of it is personal loans, out of which almost half of it is housing loans. And then you have credit cards and uh, other loans and auto loans and all these constitute the balance loans which the banks have lent. I guess this just helps you uh, get a perspective. And I've just given you in the last one year how each category has grown. Uh, ag agricultural loans have grown 20%. Industry loans have grown only 8%. But if you look at these categories here, look at the growth rate. 28% personal loans. Keep this in mind. I'll come to it. Why I, this is relevant. You know, that's been uh, the driver of credit growth in the economy for a long while now. Okay. Uh, Jan 24 is a little misleading because this includes HDFC, uh, which got merged with HDFC Bank. And HDFC, as you know, is predominantly a home loan company. And that's why uh, this loan uh, appears high, especially the home loan proportion here, okay? Now, this, this part is the first part. I've given you a bird's eye view on how the banking landscape is, the market shares between the various categories, uh, the capital, the risk weights, and understanding about what is meant by asset quality and the breaking up of the balance sheet and PNL. Okay, this is the first part of the conversation to give you a basic understanding of how banks work. I'll get into the second half of the conversation on understanding banks, which is getting into the business model, various business models. Okay, the x-axis is uh, proportion of the loan book, which are retail assets. Y-axis is proportion of the liabilities which are retail. Retail meaning individual deposits which you and I, we get our uh, 
you know we keep our bank accounts where our incomes get credited or 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 uh, you know where where we we are our transactions for where for which you do your uh, uh, all your uh, you know if you are shopping online and you paying your credit card bills from your bank account those all current account savings account or all this goes into the retail liabilities now there are fair, four kinds of models okay some are wholesale liability funded meaning their borrowing is predominantly not from individuals but from corporates or sme okay so wholesale liability and they also predominantly lend to corporates or sme so they borrow from corporates and they lend to corporates okay there are cash rich corporates they borrow from and the loan hungry corporates to whom they lend to many state owned banks fall in that category an example is canara bank okay the second category is wholesale funded but retail advances okay they they take money from uh, large ticket not just corporates it could be high net worth individuals who are putting 25 crores of deposits into a bank okay or it could be anything more than 5 crores is called a uh, whole bulk deposits or wholesale deposits it's not called retail retail is below 5 crores so uh, uh, you know it's it's a wholesale funded uh, uh, banks they fund um, uh, retail um, you know loans okay that's this model predominantly an example of that is in the sin bank the third is retail liability and wholesale assets okay so they take money from people like you and me largely salaried accounts non resident indians and uh, who remit money into india so a large portion of the money is small ticket re, uh, very uh, granular uh, small ticket repetitive customer base giving liabilities but they lend it not to retail they lend it to corporates okay uh, example of that is federal bank and the fourth example is uh, retail liability and retail assets okay example of that is hdfc bank which is actually a, almost equal between retail and corporate and but they have one of the highest higher proportion of retail loans especially after the merger it's even more merger with hdfc so now each of these are different business models okay what i mean as business models is if you were to draw a pnl for each category this proportion will look very different this proportion will change accordingly and it will uh, some of them offer high growth some are highly profitable some have high npa some have low npa some have high cost some are low cost so the business model is varying various kinds of lending models borrowing models within banks and we as as analysts we need to understand the nuances the inner the inards of each model because we will the profitability the growth opportunity the riskiness dramatically varies okay and and what kind of multiples you will assign to them very different okay uh, the scalability and and all those things in fact talking of scalability uh, i've done another way to uh, you know uh, break up the same banks models uh, x axis is the profitability which is basically it's a function of uh, in here the profitability metric is return on assets it can be net interest margins also but ultimately net interest margins should bear out in return on assets okay so uh the x axis as i said is profitability the y axis is the cyclicality cyclicality is uh, it goes through ups and downs it's not steady state you know it's uh, you know there are business cycles sometimes demand is very good supply is low companies enjoy very good profitability sometimes supply is very high demand is weak 
profitability goes down, impacts the borrower's balance sheet and uh, their repayments get impacted. So cyclicality is on the y-axis and the size of the bubble is the scalability. Scalability means the growth potential uh, you know, for the uh, bank to grow their model. So when I evaluate a bank, I will look at uh, you know, how is the mix? How profitable can this be? If a loan book has predominantly wholesale assets, it is across cycles because you know it is low on profitability, high on cyclicality, but the potential for growth is very high. Okay, because there are a lot of borrowers and they'll take large amounts of money. And so you can scale it up, but it will be difficult to make profit margins significantly enough to uh, you know to to for you to be attractive to gain capital. And the loan book will also have its ups and downs across cycles. If you have a loan book which is predominantly on, say, for example, credit cards, okay. Now, very profitable. If you see here, it falls right side, almost extreme right here. Very profitable. Has its own cyclicality. It's high on cyclicality. But the growth potential is not very high. Okay, It is not a very scalable model. Now, consumer durable, on the other hand, is high on uh, profitability high on cyclicality, but low on scalability. So I will take an assessment of the bank's loan book, where all, which are all the categories that, uh, you know, they fit in the breakup of the loan book and, uh, you know, try to assess the scalability potential, the profitability potential, the cyclicality risks. All this matters a lot in, in understanding what kind of, how I should estimate the profitability, the riskiness or uh, the potential and the all, all of them go into the multiples which I am willing to give for the bank. Now, this takes me to valuation. Okay. Now, you know, very important slide. In fact, if you ask me one slide, very important, it is this in this whole presentation, wherein, uh, you know, in fact, I have presented this slide to so many banks and managements, to CEOs. They have asked me, some banks are trading at half times price to book. Some are trading at eight times price to book. How do you guys assign multiples? You know, Assigning valuation multiple, as many of you are budding analysts, so you will all know, is not science. It's an art. Okay. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a function of so many variables which go into it. Uh, I can spend an hour on this slide actually. In fact, recently I met uh, the CEO of a large NBFC, a listed NBFC. That CEO wanted to understand, uh, you know, what all variables go into uh, the valuation. Uh, like this, there's so many. One management quality, most important of all. Banks, as I said initially, this is the only business where you dole out money to the customer. So the skill is not in lending money. Okay, Anybody can lend. The skill is in not just being able to make it profitable. You, If you take high risk, you can take high reward. But the, it's about the jugglery of growth, profitability, asset quality, and ROE. Okay, All four that's the key okay now does the management have a track record of delivering performance not once but across cycles this is actually lending business is all about trust in management capability and the track record of the ceo the senior members of the management team the promoter team not just in this bank you know it could be they could be employed somewhere else how has their performance been? This is most important variable. Second is skin in the game. Okay, How incentivized are the management team? Alignment of interest between the shareholders and the management. Uh, and, and alignment means 
how their kras are how their ownership is how uh, their skin in the game is aligned to the shareholders uh, skin in the game is it short term incentives is it long term incentives uh, is it over emphasis on growth is it over emphasis on profitability what are the metrics that go into it we'll understand third stickiness of second line management team okay not just ceo not just the board members but actual banking is done by the second line third line you get to understand the management depth and and uh, you know uh, understand them okay have they created bandwidth the fourth point is ability to guide and meet guidance which basically means walk the talk how is their track record been investors go with management quality track record but they want to assess whether you are walking the talk okay fourth uh, sorry that's the fourth one the fifth one is any red flags on governance like any related party transactions are you lending a lot to your own group companies or your uh, families or how is your ownership structure are you uh, you know how is the are you uh, you know uh, how who's funded you and and what kind of investor profile you have uh, can it be a vulnerable if you are heavily owned by some business group or uh, some other borrower and and you know all those kind of softer aspects come into the picture this is all qualitative okay management quality and governance and track record and those things getting into the business side of things the most important side and within that is does the bank have an asset advantage or a liability advantage or any other advantage basically any other advantage means uh, i'll explain to you so i'll go back to this first point now what do i mean by asset advantage if i am lending to a category where the yields are high and the profitability is high okay that higher yields so where will it come from it will come from this category okay high yielding highly profitable so do you have a right to win there do you why will competition uh, give you market share do you have capability your distribution your knowledge of the customer knowledge of the product uh, ability to scale it up do you have an asset advantage in loans or do you have a liability advantage you know basically means do you have the ability to keep the funding costs See, look at hdfc bank right extremely low interest expense one of the least in the country and as a result if you see here that comes from low current account i mean high proportion of casa okay cheap source of funding repetitiveness very sticky and scalable because scalable why because once you are all of you have i'm sure have bank accounts uh, okay when you have a bank account your income comes there your expenditures go there uh, go from there you will have your uh, you know home loan emi or your uh, uh, vehicle loan emi from there you keep minimum balance you buy shares from there you maintain low bal ba balances there you so basically transaction leads to stickiness right and stickiness leads to value okay because you are forced to keep more balances there right that gives advantage on liability any other advantage fee income very strong credit assessment capability those are all other advantages that you that a bank enjoys for which you have a valuation premium that is in some form linked to the does the customer segmentation have pricing power in the sense uh you know uh, uh, uh if a, a loan to a wholesale if you are lending to say reliance industries reliance industries will ask you for the finest of pricing you don't make profits there but if you are lending to a gold loan customer this customer is not he is typically pledging his jewelry for something uh, for a one month emergency need typically he is Uh, other sources of funding is not available so and uh, you know uh, uh, you can charge higher rates of interest or to a microfinance customer who doesn't have too many formal funding op options okay 
so you can charge him more okay so that gives you pricing power consistency across cycles okay uh, not just up cycle but across cycles how has the company's quality of loan book npas performed frequency of dilution i'll come to it in a while then you look at you know um, the management's proactive or is it a very reactive they see a risk after the risk plays out you know many banks aggressively lent to power sector in 2007 to 11 they thought that was sector to grow and they lent money indiscriminately 2012 onwards those assets started becoming uh, you know difficult to repay get uh, to get the collections they stopped lending what's the point you have already lent money it's become an npa okay so so uh, uh, you know um, that's what we look at how proactive are you whereas there are some banks you know proactively they'll have a credit underwriting team which will have be so good on quality that they will see risk two years ahead, one year ahead, five years ahead and say, I don't want to take too much risk in this category. And so they'll step back, they'll reduce the exposure, they'll go to very selective, they will protect the balance sheet quality. Okay. How, how worried is the management about stock price? You know, short term, short stock price volatility, every quarter, you know, some managements we have met, okay, so for whom, you know, they will, a lot of their decision making subconsciously, they are worried about how their stock price will behave. So they don't want it to be impacted. So they'll take decisions which are good for short term stock price, but not long term wealth creation. Okay. So we'll watch for them that also. How is the scalability? Does the product offer runway for growth, long runway for growth? If there is if the product is scalable, right? As I said here, scalability in this model uh, is the bubble, okay? The size of the bubble, okay? Um, if you are home loan, okay? Si size of the opportunity is very high. India is still such a large uh, home loan opportunity. The pecking order, the balancing between growth, profitability, asset quality, and ROE, ROA, capital efficiencies. That's the ultimately the key. You can have very high growth, very highly profitable, it will come back to bite you because your NPAs can be very high or you have lent only to, uh, you know, wholesale, uh, say RIL kind of companies, you can grow. Profitability will be very low. ROE will be very high, very low. Asset quality can be very good because AAA corporate. So this again, doesn't make sense if it is a large portion. No, it's all portfolio proportions that we look for, okay? the balancing, the jugglery act. Okay, Then how is your competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis others? Are you me too? Are you unique? Is your product, uh, does of others offer it? Uh, riskiness, I mentioned, technology initiatives, right? Uh, uh, you know, your quality of your uh, app, app on the on the internet or, or on the phone, um, you know, how different is it? How user-friendly it is or how uh, unique it is? makes a lot of difference. How many products you cross sell? Do you have a broking tie up? Do you have an insurance tie up? Do you have a, a general insurance or life insurance? Or do you have, uh, you know, some other cross selling? Uh, how compliance, say for example, you all have heard about Paytm Bank, uh, non adherence to regulations. And mind you, it was not new, it was coming two years. The RBI has been telling investors, that and we all knew and and still various as investors uh you know didn't prioritize it and they paying the price for having uh, a compromised on um you know their investment on the valuation multiple they overpaid and lastly these two points conservative accounting and frequency of dilution frequency of dilution is also in some form linked to capital efficiency okay because if you are very high return on equity, then you will you will not dilute too much unless you grow, you know, if your ROE is 18% and you keep growing 50%, you will keep diluting, okay? At some stage, it will start impacting. Uh, but if you are able to manage growth and keep diluting, you can. But in learnings have been that the more frequently 
somebody keeps raising equity they keep diluting uh, it somewhere starts biting into valuation multiple because somewhere it starts eating into capital efficiencies okay lastly conservative accounting and conservative accounting is about provisioning fee income how uh, you know uh, uh, aggressive are you are you uh, prudent in provisioning and you are seeing uh, some uh, uh, risk ahead so you are creating buffers shock absorbers already all those things matter a lot so you can see there are 15 20 variables which go into how we value a bank okay it is not an excel sheet model exercise okay models are very small portion of how we evaluate a bank a large portion of it comes from various uh, other elements this is i've come to the end of the second part where i've given you a sense of the uh, you know the business models in the bank uh, the the mix between cyclicality, profitability, scalability, uh, and how what are all the elements which go into assessing a multiple? Some banks trade one time book, some trade eight times book. Why why not? Okay, all these elements go into it. Okay. Third part of the conversation is a little uh, you know next year outlook. Okay. Uh, I'll spend less time here. We'll spend more time on questions after this. But just to give you a quick heads up, uh, there are, in our view, more headwinds than tailwinds uh, getting into next year. Uh, the tailwinds are banks are all very well capitalized. The capital adequacy that I mentioned here, uh, okay, uh, banks are well, the net worth of banks' balance sheet is very healthy after very, after almost seven, eight years of RBI's uh, efforts. Post-COVID, banks are in very healthy capital position. Uh, margins are okay, pretty healthy. In fact, the current year will possibly be the best margin profile for banks. Uh, asset quality, uh, pretty benign. As I said, banks, they have not uh, taken undue risks. So outlook into next year, not worrisome on credit quality. This current year, Banks, many banks also took uh, a lot of wage hikes uh, that hurt the profitability to some extent. But from next year, that will that will also uh, you know uh, get into the it will start yielding operating leverage. Then why do, why are we saying that there are some headwinds? There are quite a few. Uh, one element is first key element is deposit accretion. Okay, deposit growth is weak. And that will put pressure on deposit rates that can slow down the growth. Okay. Second is uh, India's uh, banks are moving towards IFRS. Uh, it's called uh, expected credit loss. New basis of credit costs assessment. Okay. So I go back to this point. What I meant is this line item called provisions. There are new rules coming in place. Currently, how it works in India is backward looking, as in after an asset becomes NPA, you start providing for it, except to the extent of small extent towards what is called a, a, a standard assets provisioning, which is a small portion, but otherwise it's post-mortem. Okay? Whereas what we are likely to go into is ECL, which is expected credit loss, which is futuristic start provisioning based on the track record of the segment, the track record of your own performance over last 10 years, provisioning will have to get, uh, uh, will be a function of expected credit loss, not backward, not after an asset becomes NPA, but predicting it on based on track records, probabilities, and all of them, okay? The, that's the second risk. The third is the Reserve Bank has started telling banks to slow down on unsecured retail because I was mentioning here that, uh, where did I mention? Okay. Um, yeah. I was mentioning here that, uh, 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 you know, uh, unsecured credit cards, loans, other personal loans, you see the kind of growth rate which is happening. This has been continuing for the last, since COVID, three years. So the central bank is a little wary and he started telling 
banks guys uh, you know slow down in your lending and lending to nbfcs who lend so slow down okay and that will that's the third uh, uh, risk the fourth is there is a new new regulation coming which will impact treasury income treasury income what i mean i go back to this as i mentioned banks have uh, government bonds or other investments how you uh, hold it to maturity or you are keeping it in the trading book it's called available for sale or or uh, you know various categories are there uh, and that gives you as part of other income there is an element of treasury income for hdfc bank it is lesser for various other banks it is a lot higher uh, and and that element there are new rules coming which will reduce that income line item for banks going forward fourth that's the fourth one the fifth one is uh, there is an expectation and uh, we also believe maybe not in the next 6 9 months but in the next uh, Uh, likelihood that in calendar 25 reserve bank will start cutting interest rates and that we think can also lead to margin uh, uh, pressure and lastly credit costs which basically is provisions and as i i go back to the slide for explaining most things the provisions to assets which is at 0.5% there is this is well below the long term average for hdfc bank it's in like for many other banks the current year or fi 23 both have been low balled there is a risk that it can start mean reverting going back to long term averages okay that is the uh, 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 sixth risk so we see six risks and four positives so getting into next year we are a little cautious on our outlook on the banking sector and we have been cautious for a while now when we are telling investors that work with some cautious outlook next year okay uh, some other slides i have but these are uh, goes into too much detail and too much of uh, uh, you know i'm just explaining why i mentioned liquidity in point 3 i'm just explaining why it is tight liquidity in the system uh i mean many of you may be too new as analysts or very uh, freshers in understanding banks these are uh, you know details or third degree fifth degree uh, of detail and so i I'm, i'm not too sure it's absolutely relevant or you will relate or understanding it can go above your head uh, you know why are deposits weaker uh, what is the impact all of them see i've explained okay uh, and i've also gone on to explain that if interest rates start going down after 6 9 months what kind of banks so i'm breaking it up uh, banks so a framework okay a valuation or an estimation of earnings or assessment of banks all right you know what the breaking up the assets liabilities you know proportion of casa how much of the liabilities are repricing next year how much of the assets are repricing Uh, you know the repricing means whether the loan the rate on the loan will it go up or down or are or are they fixed rate loans there is something called eblr which is external benchmark linked loans which are uh, um, you know uh, linked to repo rates which rbi gives out there is something called mclr which is marginal cost of funding linked rate loans of a bank how much of it is retail and and then i look at pricing power and and then i rank the banks i have not given the bank names here because of some uh, uh, you know uh, 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 compliance reasons but but uh, i am ranking the banks according to how their assets are liabilities are the pricing the pricing power the 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 asset liability uh, proportions repricing risks and all of them something similar we have done for nbfcs also rank them based on obviously nbfcs don't have savings account current account as you will know but they have other kinds of liabilities and as a result we try to do all of this uh, last before i pause uh, the last uh, thing which 
many of you might be interested in to know uh, is many of you might have even taken small ticket personal loans uh, you know rbi as i told you has started getting cautious on this category and has told banks and nbfcs to watch out for risks here slow down and has increased the risk weight because he's getting a little cautious why is he cautious because uh, this line item is a uh, is a growing line item npas in the sub 50000 rupees category has started going up to 10% npas out of 100 rupees lent 10% is becoming npas and in the below 50000 rupee personal loan okay above 50000 is still okay but the the fact is if you look at this chart out here uh, in as of june 23 more than 50% of the small ticket personal loan uh, borrowed by banks have uh, you know uh, uh, four already four uh, i mean out of all the borrowers more than 50% have already four or more loans okay so is there some bit of evergreening happening in the sense are people borrowing small loans to repay larger loans and is this low npa is it camouflaging is it some kind of window dressing okay that's what is made reserve bank a little uh, cautious especially on nbfcs okay uh, that's why they've gone a little cautious and they've told telling investors to way, watch out so the what could be the impact rbi has brought in regulatory action banks will are tightening the norms and which means the impact on credit card players microfinance companies or even gold loan to some extent or especially banks and nbfcs with high fintech uh, arrangements they can be at risk okay that's what we are uh, referring to i have just explained some annexures here which we can park it for now i will pause here i will take uh, 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 you know all of you can Uh, gather your thoughts uh, you know maybe i can uh, take some questions how do you form a queue question queue uh, shailesh up to you uh, you want to read out the questions or you want to have the uh, students ask questions i leave it to you uh, sure sir thank you so much sir uh, sir uh, of the reading material which you had shared what we did we shared it with students to go through before the session only to make sure that they can absorb even further from the session so sir what i've done is i've marked few sections in the ppt itself of the questions submitted by the candidates which i'll try to relay on their behalf and there are few questions which candidates have asked live on zoom chat so with your permission uh, may i share the screen of the ppt yeah, which was i will share my you? yeah i will stop sharing you can share your screen okay sir uh so i think uh, this is it yeah so if we think about this uh, so this was the seventh slide of the ppt shared by you oh. sir mm. uh, in this slide the question was more towards the lines that now that india is getting added into the emerging market bond indexes yeah and it is expected that india will get more or less let's say some bit of flows uh, more than 10 billion dollars flows in the upcoming year um so the question was around the cost of capital is expected to go lower because the yields of these government bonds will go lower with getting more funding from global markets increasing into bond prices and inversely lowering down the yields and thereby reducing the cost of capital for let's say companies or let's say even for banks so is it expected that the net interest margin for banks will go up because of this move or what are your thoughts on the same so uh, you know there are two parts to this question one is uh, will we get those kind of flows which are expected hmm. uh, the expectation is not 10 billion or thereabouts expectation is 30 to 40 billion okay um, that's why i have mentioned that it is not likely to be so much it is likely to be underwhelming 
and the reason i mentioned is the the key reason is the chart on the bottom right which is the interest rate differentials i don't know how many of your students are uh, are uh, students of fixed income and they understand the yields and uh, what drives uh, uh, interest rate differentials and forward premiums and all those things are uh, uh, very important but where where but as i said i started my career in fixed income in credit so uh, a fair bit of this understanding i picked up early in my career uh, around your age around the students age early 20s and and uh, my assessment is the interest rate differentials in india today are not attractive for the active see the index has two components active and passive okay passive money will come active money unlikely to come okay are unlikely to be of that magnitude so the expectation which we have and it's our view that the flows are likely to be underwhelming due to chart number 4 that is the reason the yields are not attractive enough and uh, the post tax returns are not attractive enough now if the federal reserve which is so far not cut rates but they have said that they will cut rates three times this year beginning june expectation is now beginning june if rates get cut in the us and if india rates central bank in india doesn't cut rates which is what i told you that i don't expect rate cuts to come in india for this reason then the interest differential start widening okay if it widens it can attract flows but keep in mind that if it widens it that means rbi doesn't cut rates in which case the cost of funding doesn't come down okay if it doesn't come down then it it has a different element now it is not so straightforward because i was mentioning in the one of the last slides that banks have this component called eblr and mclr okay eblr is external benchmark linked rate loans that is if rbi cuts rates banks also cut rates because those loans are repo rate linked loans okay if the rbi doesn't cut rates those rates don't go down that means the banks lending rate is higher that means their nims are higher okay but if rbi cuts rates those lending rates go down those lending rates go down it hurts margins now this is a new phenomenon for banks banks didn't have eblr linked loans till covid or maybe till till about 19 there it the previous regime 2010 to 20 was more about mclr okay or what was called base rate in 2009 or 10 so mclr is marginal cost lay, lay, the bank's funding cost so it was not external benchmark linked it was the internal funding cost based so if the funding cost came down banks could pass it on but that mix has changed so applying the learnings that we had on banks before 2020 is no longer relevant as relevant the eblr proportion has gone up in the loans in the loan mix mm -hmm. so the there are so many moving parts so your your question whether this yields coming down the those flows coming in will it lead to nims coming going up not at all easy straightforward answer there are 10 moving parts to answer this our assessment is the if the reserve bank cuts rates actually bank margins will go down if reserve bank doesn't cut rates then these flows will come if reserve bank cuts rates these flows can also not come and that will actually be a negative bigger negative for banks so banking sector how it's evolved today is not like how it was pre covid there are so many more moving parts dynamics involved does that answer the question yes sir yes sir thank you so much sir uh moving to the sorry right sir uh so moving to the next question so this was actually covered in one of the pointers of your headwind section 
where you are talking about sourcing of incremental you know uh, deposits is becoming Correct. even more difficult because Correct. there are various other alternatives which are available for banks or for other investors rather than having let's say a fd or any other deposits into the banks to get even higher returns uh, for themselves so making it difficult for banks to source these kind of deposits um how do you foresee this this problem to pan there out are, in the uh, yeah so so there are two parts out here one is uh, this gets into little economics uh, not just banking sector but still it's very relevant okay um, now there is something called uh, base money m0 i don't know how many of your many of you all will will be aware of it there is something called m1 m2 m3 which is uh, uh, what is called money supply and that drives deposits growth okay uh, to make it answer your question relating to it easier assume avendas my employer gives me salary okay first of every month money moves from their bank account current account to my savings account okay when it was in there when when the their client which is my when my client paid avendas money moved from the client's current account to the avendas current account so when money this is called money multiplier effect okay money multiplies and every level there is something called fractional banking wherein it's a deposit to the recipient again crr slr is created again mon that money is again deposit uh, is created that again is lent okay so when it comes into my bank account again you know on the deposit which i get it is again crr slr is created so basically uh, you know uh, um, this is how mac fractional banking uh, works and uh, 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 you know the 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 core of it is what is called base money or this is called reverse uh, reserve money okay now the crux of what we are saying is last year if many of you recall in the month of may uh, rbi recalled 2000 rupee notes okay 2000 rupee notes were money kept after demon uh, till demon we didn't have 2000 rupee notes 2000 rupee notes got created in 2016 but they were less circulated i'll put it differently they were uh, kept as cash by the uh, uh, individuals or corporates or households and when the recall happened that went into banks as deposits because banks gave them uh, you know they went into deposits or they got 500 rupee notes i mean uh, or any magnitude it could be 100 or 500 or whatever right so but what we noticed was it converted into deposits so if you see in this table in fi24 the second row there incremental deposit in fi23 was 15.8 lakh crores and in fi24 it was 23 lakh crores so there was a sharp jump in deposits in fi24 the current financial year ending this week india got huge deposit inflow that was able to fund the credit growth that was led by multiple variables one large variable was what i'm pointing out in fi23 if you remember the ukraine war had started and oil went up india saw a uh, uh, outflow of deposits or what we called balance of payments uh, you know forex reserves went down so deposits were impacted before that in the covid period uh, india got huge liquidity forex reserves went up if you remember uh, facebook and google and all those in money they invested in ril india oil prices went down uh, a foreign direct investment all the dot coms got funding and all those internet companies got huge funding fdi fpi flows were good so forex reserves accrual scheme that went in as excess liquidity so we we long story short uh, i'm trying to keep it simple not too complicated but still this is the minimum complication that i need to explain this concept that you were enough there were enough reserve money created to fund the growth getting into fi25 we think there isn't excess liquidity we think reserve money creation will be lesser 
unless india pulls a rabbit out of the hat and india gets those 30 40 billion dollars of uh, uh, bond inclusion related flows unless that comes and creates reserve money uh, or money money multiplier we think deposit growth in the coming year will be tough will be tight that's one of the primary reasons i was mentioning on uh, you know the credit slowdown deposit slowdown and uh, the liquidity tightness in the banking system now they all have an implication on the cost of funding if there is one reason why banks have underperformed in the last 3 months you know hdfc bank after the results uh, you know it faced the uh, uh, all this go into it you know liquidity tightness deposits in the system being slower uh, why is it slower and and all those elements have an impact ultimately on earnings multiples and the stock prices on the valuation of the bank got it sir got it fair a enough, little sir. it's a difficult question i mean i am not trying to explain in, in too much detail because many of the students may not fully relate to you know the money supply i might i don't want to talk jargon i am not an economist uh, i am an analyst but i relate to economics very well because i have been a banks analyst but i don't want to talk economic jargon and confuse students no no sir thank you so much anyways for dumbing it down a lot um moving to the next question which we had was uh, sir on this slide it's more on the lines of uh, capex happening in private sectors so yeah. typically the way banks uh, you know loan or credit book growth will happen on because of demand of loans from let's say private sectors when the capex kicks in yeah now the you know the the typical stories which we have heard have always been revolving around you know the real estate sector booming in you know the india having the youngest population making sure one of the drivers in the real estate sectors um at the same time uh, you've mentioned here on the cement as well as steel part the one thing which was very very uh, you know something which we thought was very curious was this part where the difference between the supply and demand aspect of cement the gap itself in 2019 was 144 which is more or less the estimated gap what we are expecting it in fy24 at the same time when we talk about cement, uh, steel uh, the similar kind of gap is there in 2019 and 2024 now i mean the the private sector capex didn't kick in 2019 yeah. but uh yeah why should it pick what up makes now? us think that it yeah. will kick, kick now yeah fair question very good question and i'll answer that so you know uh this is the answer is not in numbers okay the answer is um can you can you um can you go to um, the second note i sent yesterday the second uh, attachment so just a second let me let me open it uh yes sir yeah just go to the sector keep going i'll i'll tell you sure sir yeah hold here hold here yeah no yeah. no the pre, yeah just make it a full screen okay or or make it bigger okay so this this is an important slide to answer your question okay now what i i'll explain what i mean here now one of in, what we you know as analyst and as a strategist uh, you know telling investors i my my clients are portfolio managers and chief investment officers at fii's domestic mutual funds hedge funds sovereign funds uh, 
uh, what we have been telling them right from before COVID, just before COVID onwards, till maybe six months back, one of India's most powerful reasons why we thought India will do well and why India has actually done well is this whole concept of market share consolidation. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. market share consolidation, what I mean is, for example, if you take, since you raised the topic, cement. Okay. Now, yeah. look at the third row there. Okay. In fiscal 10, the top five cement companies, they constituted 35% of sales of total industries volumes that went up by fi 17 to 46 percent by fi 23 it's gone up to 58 percent in okay. fact on the incremental growth the top five cement companies have taken 89.9 percent so the industry has become super consolidated okay okay now same thing happened in banks in steel in nbfc's as you know in nbfc's uh, you know, Divan, how, uh, India Bulls and others slowed down and the ones who survived took it up in telecom. You know, many of them failed and closed down. Only RIL and Geo uh, uh, and uh, Bharti have survived. Others have died. Uh, you know, in aviation, except Indigo and Air India, others have died. Okay. Uh, same thing if you see passenger cars in India, we have seen only, uh, you know, Hyundai, Maruti, Tata Motors, m, &M to an extent, Kia, Survive, others have General Motors, Ford, Nissan, Renault, Toyota, even Honda, they've all lost market share, okay? So something, this big becoming bigger or consolidation of market shares was super attractive, okay? And then you see the right, the impact of this came that led market share gains, led volume growth, oligopoly industry structure led better pricing power, that led to better margins, gross margins, better EBITDA margins, better return on capital, better cash flows. Cash flows went into debt repayment. Debt repayment went, meant value migration from enterprise value to equity value, better multiples for higher, better quality of growth. And most importantly, the last point, that has given confidence for managements to expand capacity and to protect market share, okay? So the private capex cycle is not being built for other reasons. It is not demand, it is supply, okay? That is, comp large companies are telling, say cement, you know, Ultratech, Adani, Adani is in, uh, ACC and Ambuja have gone into Adani now, okay? Uh, Shri Cement, Dalmia Bharat. So four players, their market share has gone up. Their balance sheet is in good shape. They are telling, I don't want the smaller players to come back in a large way like how it was in 2010. If you see the top five were only 35%. Hmm. But on the incremental growth, they are taking 90%. So they are saying, we want to protect our market share. So I'm going to do CapEx. I am going to give, create, generate capacities, put up new capex, my balance sheet is in good shape, I don't have debt, I've repaid the debt, I'm very profitable, the industry has come to a few player oligopolic structure, we want to keep it that way. So they are saying, I'm going to put up capex. That is why, you know, you're seeing capex in cement, in steel, though the capacity utilization is not very high for the industry but the top few players their capacity is very high utilization is very high so the okay. top few players their balance sheet is good their capacity utilization is high and their market share they want to retain so they are planning capex this is the context of the capex cycle in this time and each cycle has its own reasons sometimes it is demand sometimes it is supply Sometimes, you know, all of you travel here in Indigo, okay? I'm sure many of you would have seen news maybe six months back that Indigo is ordering 500 aircrafts. Air India is ordering 400 aircrafts. Are, why do you need so many aircrafts? Because obviously India's tourism is doing well and many airports are coming and all of this is true. 
not taking away you know indians are being given visa free travel in thailand in malaysia in in maldives and and uh, you know in bali and many countries vietnam and others but but the bigger reason is the industry wants to protect the oligopolic structure if indigo orders 500 if air india orders 450 there is very little supply which can boeing or air airbus can produce to sell to a third player to a fourth player that creates that you know that oligopolic structure pricing power gets created sustained so the capex cycle is coming from these angles predatory in nature predatory capex preventive capex you know so the nature of capex cycle this time is to for industry so if you ask promoters and and we speak to promoters of companies often promoters are focused most highest priority for them is market share they know that if they protect market share they'll get profitability at some stage so you ask them they'll say market share number one priority so to protect their market share is a they have to do capex and no reason for them not to do their balance sheet is in good shape banks will give them money equity markets are good they if they want they'll, they'll raise money ipos or qips will come so they are asking why shouldn't i do capex and take protect my market share that leads to the capex cycle got it so got it sir thank you thank you so much for uh, such a detailed answer sir uh sir moving to the next uh question just a second yeah uh sir on this we actually wanted to understand yeah. like is there a publicly available source apart from world investment report and let's world say world investment report is the source Uh, any other source apart from that apart from you know the rbi monthly bulletin or world investment this report data which... point you will not get anywhere only okay. in the world investment report got it sir got it the that was the only question from this slide uh i think yeah the last question is from this slide sir uh, i i believe some of this part has already been covered by I you covered and, it. yeah uh but the one thing which which is very very interesting which is happening here obviously uh, you know uh, what's happening in india has happened in developed countries over past few decades where you know the consumption pattern changes at the same time uh, what rbi sees to be a concern today where uh, you know the growth in unsecured retail credit uh, obviously it is very well warranted because it's happening on back of personal loans and let's say um, which is where we wanted to understand is is this a right trend which india should be moving into or something which needs to be constrained at this current point in time so it no the the jury is out okay uh, in my view this needs to be constrained there is a fair bit of indiscipline which has happened amongst lenders and borrowers and uh, especially the unsecured personal loans and uh, you know uh, uh, fintech especially originated or lent by fintech companies uh, there is a fair bit of indiscipline which has happened and uh, buyer borrower behavior has been altered and i think rbi is absolutely right in proactively you know uh moderating this category this category can be a little risky one more angle to this is somewhere there is a concern that how much of it we don't know but while the if you see the top right side the right chart yeah we, this is, that's the paisa bazar data on where the loans went okay but somewhere there is a concern that some part of this loans went into markets markets including equity markets option trading markets cryptocurrency market or or uh, you know uh, some market and speculating activities and and uh, we see end use of personal loans are difficult to monitor if you buy a if you take a home loan 
the money is given by the bank directly to the developer but if you take a home loan whether you are actually spending it for the reason you took or you put that money into a stock and you spent your salary on this expenditure money is fungible somewhere there is a concern that there is some bit of uh, over leverage especially mass consumption mass borrowers the the credit score of 750 and above is not the concern it is the credit score of 600 650 and below what is called subprime that customer segment is the concern uh uh all right sir i think from this ppt uh the uh, questions which we had marked to relay on behalf of the students uh you know thank you so much for answering those questions in detail there are few other questions which we would like to ask as well sir uh, over to you prateek hi ganesh sir uh, prateek this side i am one of the faculty here uh, sir even i have received uh, two two questions specifically and they are hardcore on the numbers part so sir like number one as you said there are two moving variables one is yield and one is cost of fund and uh, if we move cost of fund even by half percent one percent the delta in pack and hence roe is one of the largest so sir one of the questions here was that although you have explained that cost of fund should be lower uh for a bank that results in a long term advantage but sir initially it was easy due to the branch networks which was being established to gain current account saving come but since then a lot of fundamental changes have happened in the banking industry sir uh, for example the availability of other small saving schemes right uh uh savings account channelization a bit into Uh, equity side as per the current household consumption survey too correct that we can understand uh so at current point of time sir how do you grill down uh the composition of uh casa and uh the borrowings of a bank so that their cost is sustainably low if we can see recently a lot of banks have also gone uh, towards external commercial borrowing a lot because that cost of fund somehow comes around the savings account uh return that is provided so sir we wanted your insight on the same yeah so uh, you know this needs some bit of uh, you know um, clarity in the sense assume i got my salary it's in my savings account i decide to buy a car money goes from my savings account to say maruti's current account or a dealer's current account or to maruti's current account okay ultimately money stays in the banking system it can move from my savings to current or i put it in an fd or maruti puts it in fd but it is in the banking system similarly i buy a mutual fund or buy a stock money moves from my savings account into the mutual fund's current account mutual fund buys the stock so by any stock so money moves from their current account into some sellers savings or current account it stays in the banking system so even though it moved from savings to current or current into savings or into debt term deposit it went in from deposit to equity into mutual fund but that doesn't change the fact that ultimately money stays in the banking system end of day it is in the banking system sure. even though i could have, i could have bought a bond i could have bond bought a stock i could have bought anything but ultimately uh, you know it is in the banking system okay that's so deposits don't get impacted due to investors choosing to buy equity or bond or keeping it as fd now if they go to the atm withdraw cash and keep it as cash then it goes out of the banking system number 1 or if they pay tax 
government has taken that money and government has not spent that money it will lie government keeps cash balance with reserve bank that cash balance will go up temporarily that has taken the liquidity away from my bank account into reserve bank and that money is not come into the system once government spends it they will give it a subsidy or they'll buy give it as an order for a road or they will pay salary to government employees it will come back into deposits it's a timing difference third oil prices shoot up okay or india's current account deficit goes through the roof or if fdi fpi outflows happen forex reserves go down in which case money goes out from i pay more for oil so my savings bank balance goes down i give money to indian oil assume or hp or bp they are paying more for some middle east uh, oil imports so they go to their say state bank and they'll give the rupees borrow dollars give it to the oil company because more dollars in which case the money sucked out get sucked out of my savings account it goes to the hdfc or state bank account uh, state bank of india who will go to the forex market sell rupees buy dollars give it to ioc go so money goes into the forex market rbi steps in there he buys the rupees sells the dollars and it comes back so it goes back into rbi so it goes out of my system into rbi okay. or it goes out of india that these are the only ways money goes out of the banking system otherwise it is in the banking system once it is in the banking system it is a function of velocity how fast money multiplies okay money multiplier effect is a function of activity levels and all those things so to answer your question it is the the structural changes in the behavior of more equity buying more ecb this doesn't change the deposit structure of the bank That's sir a, a counter question sir here was then uh if we sir then analyze the deposit structures of the bank sir see uh if sir please correct me if i'm wrong here so i think the currency in circulation has been reasonably around 9% right correct uh and the balance of payment structures in india currently also is reasonable right uh so sir like if these two parameters are not changing which according yeah. to you are one of the major outflows from the banking Absolutely. system uh then sir how this entire conundrum of uh, attracting low cost deposit which has helped then now banking maintain and yeah. nims yeah uh, will be sustainable correct very good question so the reason india is having deposit slow down in spite of credit growth credit creates deposits i told you yes. currency in circulation has not gone up like what you said bop forex reserves have not gone down why are then deposits not there okay two reasons number one household savings rate is at a five decade low in india the net savings rate why because not gross savings the leverage has gone up wow. okay so that is one key reason that means households are spending more money on interest and on emis that money is not creating deposits to somebody else it's going into banks or nbfcs on debt repayment or interest payment it is to that extent hurting deposit growth reason one the second reason is small savings okay ppf post office they are not in the banking system government didn't want to during the since covid started uh, you know they are borrowing 4 5 lakh crores every year from small savings to fund their fiscal deficit yes. what would have otherwise been deposit growth for state bank of india or hdfc bank it has gone into small savings and got rooted to government spend government spent it came back but again it went into small savings so to that extent it has impacted money supply deposit growth that has also led to deposit growth getting weaker so to again answer your question even though we didn't have currency in circulation spike even though uh, bop was in control deposit growth is weak for because of these reasons and that has hurt 
deposit mobilization, CD ratios of banks, CD ratios credit to deposit ratios, and it has impacted. We think it can slow down the lending book lending growth rate of banks going forward, which we think is one of the slowing down reasons potentially next year. Okay, uh, th thank you so much, Ganesh sir, for this explanation. Uh, sir, just uh, one one more question. I hope I am not consuming too much of your time. No, 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 that's okay. Sir, we are, I have, uh, we, have, the... we have another. Uh, 12 more minutes till 6 p.m. I've carved this out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I would directly jump on to the next question then. Sir, uh, in, again, on the revenue front, sir, there is, as you, as you talked, one of the major contribution is also yield on investments. Sir, especially, like, what, what are your thought processes when you start analyzing the investment books of a bank? Because apart from government securities, the especially the debenture and bond uh, portions, which are a majority of time available for sale securities also. So that creates a lot of volatility on the PN side of, of a banking business. Okay. So what, what are your uh, so there are how do you two analyze that portion? There. Yeah, there are two elements there. One is uh, uh, what comes in as interest income from investments. Second is the treasury income from the gain or loss of selling bonds, bonds. GSEC, uh, government securities, yeah. which comes in in other income. Okay. Yeah. Now, beginning next week, new norms have been put in place on how much assets can be shifted between held to maturity available for sale and, you know, um, banks Made used to... Uh, yeah. So, so banks used to they are allowed once a year to shift assets from one category to another and how many times they have done it has helped them move between categories and book treasury gains that those rules have been changed coming into effect from April 1st. So the okay. current year, this current quarter, you should see banks do this but beginning next April, that is 1st April, Next week, their rules are a lot more tied. They cannot shift assets from one category to another the way they were doing earlier. Okay. They were doing this earlier because one, it gave them interest income, I mean, capital gains. Second is when bond deals went down, bond prices go up, that gave them capital gains. They used it as a, they want to protect 1.5% ROA, so they'll book some treasury gain. So I say I bought I bought a bond when the bond yield was 8%. Okay. Correct. Today it is 7%. So I would have made treasury significant capital mm -hmm. gain. But Correct. I also need to own the bond for my SLR purpose. So what Correct. do you do? I sell and buy back. And buy. Okay. So you book the profit and you have kept it as a bond in the book. Okay. Correct. So that goes into PNL. So basically that 8% to 7% you're booking. Correct. Okay. Uh, you can't do it endlessly because you have uh, other, other requirements, but those kind of uh, trading book you can still do. Correct. AFS you can still do, but Correct. from HTM to AFS booking those, those changes will be curtailed. So going Correct. forward, beginning April, you will find lesser treasury. These capital gains will come down. Our assessment is for state-owned banks. This is about 8 to 10 basis points, maybe 8 to 10 percentage of their overall profitability okay. came from this line item. That okay. will come down. For private banks, it is lesser. Yes. All right. So perfect. So we got the insight. Uh, sir, one more question on the asset quality book front. Uh, sir, because, see, till the time, sir, the situation of a NPA cycle is out. Sir, it's already banking is as it is, you told, a trust business. The, the valuations are already way too crushed and it, it is then just a post-mortem. Sir, uh, as, a, as a participant of understanding this sector for two decades now, Sir, what are the initial signs that you start analyzing uh, in the asset book of a bank 
that makes you a bit jittery about the possible things yeah i'll explain that's actually a very important part of analyst job bank analyst job uh, to to assess it's not like banks give you all the transparent information for you to know customer wise who's borrowed we, we don't know okay correct uh, we know their sector exposure we'll do channel correct. checks to know who's aggressive correct. in which segment okay for example i'm a little wary of unsecured loans i told you correct who's growing who in the last 2 3 years who's grown aggressively in that category i'll watch which okay. customer segment corporate sme me infra textile in power port Correct. retail may home loan loan against Correct. property or gold loan i watch you know who who is vulnerable for these kind of risk so if uh, if i if for example if i have a view i don't have that view but if i have a view that gold will fall 30% okay Correct. in which case banks with a large portion of jewel loans gold, gold loans are vulnerable yeah. okay so yeah. i don't need to see it come into nps then it is journalist yeah. yes. okay? i am yeah. i am then a post mortem okay i need to be before i need to be an analyst assessing the banks vulnerabilities uh, yeah. their risk weights okay yeah. uh, where are their sector exposures where is the vulnerability likely which customer segmentation is over leverage going up okay Correct. are the banks exposed to that sector we'll watch all those okay and and assess before the problems come we will need to assess the riskiness of that category of the bank the loan book and take an assessment that am i over paying for it am i over estimating earnings and yeah. should i value the bank differently Correct. for the riskiness Correct. because i went back to one of the points that it's a jugglery between growth profitability asset quality and capital efficiency okay it's a jugglery yeah. between the four optimal it is not maximization it is optimal yeah. okay yeah. i can maximize growth and minimize the risk but risk. that will not give me roe correct yeah. i can minimize the growth maximize asset quality it will not give me return on profit uh, profitability and return on efficiency it is a judgment of jugglery optimizing the force it's a very difficult art of how much you are balancing and that's what we assess managements for are they capable do they have the track record will they do too much of growth too much of asset quality too much of profitability too much of uh, uh, focus on one category hurting something else it won't come same time correct There will be a time when growth is super, asset quality is super, profits are super, ROE is super. It can happen. It will. The pain will come the next cycle. Correct. Agree. Agree. Record across cycles matter. Correct. So just from this front, luckily our next question was around cycles only. So sir, because we in our sector module also we teach such things. So I just wanted to understand your perspective on. So, if we analyze the entire sectoral-wise deployment of banking credit, the the RBI has provided sufficient data historically. So, do you? But the way you explain, sir, I think the right way then to assess the credit quality of a particular bank might become ah uh, understanding the cyclicality in the overall sectoral deployment ah yeah. uh, in country. Like for example, if industrial overall credit. has been going down just in an example and at the same time if a bank starts focusing there that means they are trying to actually lend after bad things have happened in that sector and the quality of lending might be good so is this an appropriate way sir to start yeah. judging yes. the asset cycle yeah it's a good way but it's not the only way and i'll tell you for example uh, okay. hdfc bank in fiscal 21 the covid year Okay. Started prioritizing corporate loans after about eight years. Okay. Correct. In, in that year, others were doing opposite. Opposite retail lending. Okay. 
he went and did started doing corporate lending he 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 started slowing down retail and went into corporate lending okay right. now either he is foolhardy or he is a visionary okay right. now that's the judgment uh, okay that's right. the judgment okay as he lent uh, you know there was an occasion in fi 18 okay or okay. fi 19 okay calendar okay. 18 okay yes bank gave more loans in absolute sum than okay. hdfc bank and state bank okay in corporates to corporates yes. i mean okay. we were all like uh, you know whom is he lending to you know okay. how is how is s bank so competitive that you are lending to categories of customers which state bank who is 25 times your size okay is not lending and you are lending okay yes. we were asking arzel such questions now in that year it was super growth very okay. good profitability they don't become npas that year correct mean very good roe comes in year 1 but the pain correct. came two years later correct so it is a it, they, the same number same loan correct. can be a positive for somebody can be a negative for somebody else also so It's a, everything is about judgment. assessment judgment and uh, that's why uh, gray hair uh, helps us in in uh, in assessing if somebody is uh, uh, you know uh, wrongly aggressive or wrongly conservative i know an npc was too conservative okay okay fearing too much risk okay and compromised growth okay so it's a it's an art to juggle so just one last question i know we are about to at 6 pm just one last question sir on the npa front uh sir that npa footnotes in a banking balance sheet run across across pages and i'm not even talking about ecls of nbfc just banking sir can you just at the last front help our kids understand the npa section Uh, a a bit more clearly because a lot of the last mba cycle that people told that mba is now much lower was actually driven by the recovery footnote uh, in the overall uh, uh, mba section that the npas they assumed actually didn't happen the current write offs might be a bit lower but the main was the recovery addition in npa so sir how to actually go about the npa section analysis that yeah. will help our kids is my screen visible yeah yes sir it's completely visible so there this i had put it as an uh, annexure in the slides okay i'll send you this ppt all of you uh, you can so what what there is some this is called movement of nps okay movement of nps is opening stock additions reductions and closing stock of nps the most important are this row the movement of nps as in the additions to nps then i will match it with the gross this all these four tables so the important data points to watch out within the npa section of a bank is your additions here additions here additions here additions here and the reported pcr provision coverage ratio okay this is actually the these are the important variables within the asset quality disclosures that you need to definitely focus your attention on because banks have many banks they will have recovery upgrades written off to keep the closing stock of npa low they will say my nps are only 1% opening was 1% closing is 1% but then we will see hey that is because you wrote off Correct. if you see your slippage which is additions to nps this has become 2% of total uh, we will watch out for additions perfect sir this this is the insight sir that we wanted uh thank you so much sir if, if you allow sir one last question one minute then yeah. then sir 
Sir, uh, on, on the valuation front, sir, you mentioned about the linkages between uh, the multiples and the four, four key things. Yeah. Sir, what about banks which have a lot of holdings into a different uh, business? For example, ICICI, you have insurance there, yeah. uh, other businesses there. Sir, how, how do you go about in such yeah. a... So uh, what scenario? we do, what I'll, I'll again uh, share that slide and... Uh, so let me try to go to an empty slide and explain how we do. Okay. So let's let's let me explain here. So so what we do is so you obviously you will know that banks we value them mostly on price to book value or what we call price to adjusted book value. Adjusted book value is book value minus net NPS. That is NPS that have not been provided for. We reduce it from book value as if it is provided for accounting for tax impact. We do it and we arrive at price to adjusted book value. Okay, This is okay. in a situation where there, say, uh, uh, there are no such subsidiaries that you mentioned. Now, if there are subsidiaries, like Kotak Bank, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank or Access Bank or even State Bank, what we'll do is we will value them separately. Okay. So we'll have SOTP, some of yes. the parts. Okay. Wherein you will value the insurance subsidiary per share of the bank. How much is it? So State Bank of India says stock is 750 rupees. Yes. We'll say insurance of SBI life insurance. Say 50 rupees of SBI per share. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do like that, we'll add SBI mutual fund, SBI life insurance, SBI uh, general insurance, or SBI caps, or or all these. Uh, we will reduce it from the price. So we will, uh, uh, you know, from the stock price, the CMP current market price, we will reduce the SOTP value divided by from the adjusted book value we will reduce the investments made by the bank in these subsidiaries okay. investments in subsidiaries we reduce okay this will give the price to book of the bank alone alone okay without the sub and then we'll add the SOTP net of investments made to arrive at the target price. Target price. Good. This is what we Sir, do. is the SOTP of the subsidiary. So some of the subsidiaries might be already listed. So okay. you take their current market price or you calculate their fair value too. Because if they are overvalued, yeah. the valuation of the banking business standalone might come down. Correct. We If we cover the stock, so for example, if we are covering SBI life insurance, which we cover, it's listed, we cover, yes. we will take the valuation that the analyst has given. But okay. if it is not a coverage stock, okay, okay. but it is listed, we yes. will we will take the market value and okay. adjust it for holding company discount. Discount. All right. Thank you so much, Ganesh, sir. We got great insights through there. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all, all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. It was good speaking to you and hope it was time well spent. All the best for all of you in your uh, professional uh, endeavors. And I hope uh, uh, markets, uh, you know, the roller coaster ride markets will give you, okay, uh, you know, uh, helps you in a sense, um, you know, there will be um, great years, which could be maybe in a career of 25 years, you can expect five great years. Expect five very bad years. Okay. You have to survive those years. Okay. The brutal years like 2008 or 2013 or we thought COVID will be one such year, but it ended up being better. But, uh, uh, you know, you have to be prepared in a, in a career. Five great years, five bad years and rest of them are average years. Okay. Uh, and, and in such a way that over a 25 year career, uh, you know, you compound, uh, uh, you know, uh, across these years. But to survive those, uh, 
you know, five years is the key. Okay. Uh, you know, that is, uh, this business is all about uh, survivorship bias. Okay. Those who survive the bad years go on to benefit the good years. But if you flunk the bad years, you don't, you are not survived enough to benefit in the good years. So the whole focus of, uh, you know, uh, as an analyst is to survive the toughest five years of the career. If you have survived it, the market will tell, oh, you survived the tough years, in which case you have, you will be, you are good enough. So they will reward you in the, in the best years. So the key point, remember, is those five bad years, the five worst years you have to survive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ganeshram, sir, for Thanks. such a wonderful piece of session. I'm sure when these candidates go through the sector primers, which we have designed for banking, this is going to be an amazing piece of session for them to wrap their heads around. Um, uh, thank you so much for taking so many questions, which are completely you know, impromptu. And at the same time, thank you so much for answering it in such detail and dumping things down for almost everybody to learn and enjoy at their stage, which is just at the start of the FinBridge and FinPlus programs in Atar Institute right now. Thank you Good. so much, sir. Thanks. Thank Take you care, so all of much, you. sir. Bye. Thank you so much, sir.